Welcome again, everyone, to the Philosophy of Art and Science. As always, if you support these programs, you can head over to patreon.com slash aksum. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash aksum. You can join the substack, aksum.substack.com, and you can also contribute directly on YouTube if you're watching this on YouTube. Today, my guest is Noah Yared, a.k.a. No. Indeed, indeed. I mean, you know, I had to throw a little Amarinya in there. Uh, thank you for for doing my program. You know, what what sparked this uh, initial connection and setting up of this podcast episode were Vidya games. And for sure, we'll get to it. But I think it's more interesting to begin with science. I think science has become... A very abused word and on my channel and other spaces uh me and a few friends of mine others who are like real scientists me just kind of a an amateur in in the field but someone who takes the field seriously distinguish uh science from scientism and and sometimes people getting out of their domains so it's it's a common theme that shows up but i always love getting real men of science on the program so i have to ask was it something that you grew up with from a very young age like you knew that you were going to say and the reason and the context in which i'll ask this is i know you primarily from the sunday school so i know at least in that context that you're a reader and you're not allergic to reading and i don't say that about very many people and typically reading is seen as a skill different than you know the scientific method or science so i'm wondering how early on you knew you were a science guy and and if you even conceived of yourself in that way uh i mean i think it kind of started in uh i think elementary school um definitely saw a book about like anatomy and i just liked reading about different types of like you know like the body um and after that i think i just kind of found myself gravitating towards the science section like i read things on astronomy biology chemistry and i just kind of devoured that and then on top of that um I was really into fantasy. Like I read Harry Potter, a little bit of Lord of the Rings, like all these like fictional books. And I just kind of ate and devoured everything that kind of came in my path as a kid. Um, even Let me like, pause you there. I, I know, I know you said fantasy and by the way, I'm a huge fantasy and a sci-fi guy. Some people identify those as the same category. Some view them as different, but you went straight into the fantasy. Were you fantasy only, or did you also have sci-fi? Because I had those two series, but in addition, like Orson Scott Card's Ender's Game and and many other science fiction as well. Did did you just do fantasy, or did you do both? Do you see those as the same or different? I uh, I think I kind of threw them all in as the same. I think it's I kind of don't differentiate because, like, <laughs> funny enough, as a kid. Um, when I would be reading these books, my parents would always be like, why are you reading all this fantasy junk? Like, read something real or something like that. So, like, I still consider it, like, just the whole thing sci-fi and fantasy just kind of all together. I just, like, you know, it's, like, it's mm -hmm. made up, so I'm just going to throw it all together. And I'm going to take whatever I can get that's under my hands. Like, it was to the point where, like, you know, I would be punished. And, you know, most people, like, parents would like punish their kids like i'm gonna take away your games or like your phone my parents would take away my books and i'd sit there and do nothing or like if um even at school hardcore. teachers yeah even teachers they would take away my books and i would just sit there in class or sit there like at recess and just i mean i would play but like i would be confined to the bench and not be able to read so i was always a really big reader as a kid and, and i still am i still read i kind of i'm trying to dive back into them over. Yeah, so what's interesting about that to me is, and, and we'll come back to to reading. Now you made me curious. I remember when you left for college, I uh, I hit you with a couple books too because you were a reader and I could tell. And I, I'm not the person who just gives everyone books because you don't want it to just gather dust. Uh, so we'll check up on you on that. But the reason I ask is, again, people usually pit reading, which is word oriented and eventually people oriented against object oriented disciplines like science earlier on in elementary, you, you talk about how you read a lot of science 
did it involve any experimentation at a younger age or did that not happen until like you know high school physics and chemistry and biology like dissecting and throwing balls off of uh, buildings and stuff i uh honestly i think it was i ca- oh, mm. i think i don't think i was like super applicative with the knowledge that i gained it kind of just became auxiliary knowledge as i got older so as a young kid i would just kind of read and just really remember everything that i read it was just so fresh in my mind and it was applicable for you know the basic science classes but as i got older um reading and understanding obviously needed to become hand in hand i couldn't just memorize something like that i read because i don't know when i was a kid my brain was very flexible or just really malleable and as i got older i think I needed to apply the application of what what I was saying or what I was knowing. Um, but I mean, as I majored in it, like I majored in chemistry, concentrated in biochem, um, I kind of lost that spark because it kind of became a chore at that mm-hmm. point. But I still loved it. It was just kind of like it's mixed up with a bunch of jargon that I had to decipher at the same time. I feel like they kind of just do it on purpose that it's very unclear. Um, but in the sense of when, you know, growing up and learning, um, reading first became like, you know, like a pleasure. And then after kind of a chore at some points too. And I kind of hated how that changed, but I'm trying to get back into it and reading things. Um, I'm subscribed to a lot of um, science articles like biology and cell um, and just kind of keeping up the lexicon of words and, um, basic dogmatic principles of biology and chemistry so i don't really forget i'm in the stem field but it's very analytical there's a lot of math and a little bit of chemistry i need to apply but i mean so what are you doing now several years out of college what are you doing in in the field um so i work at amgen i work at a biotech pharmaceutical company um i work in their analytical lab so i do a lot of their analytics so i test for protein concentration throughout the different drug synthesis process. I do a lot of things for quality assurance, like I test for endotoxin, I test for any other carbon-based materials that shouldn't be in the product. Um, I test for other, like, you know, attributal chemistry, like uh, things for pH, things for conductivity, things for um, osmolality. So this is just like an attribute, like let's say if this drug is to be via injection, that it doesn't hurt the patient. It matches the osmo le- levels within the bloodstream of a patient, which is, I think, around 296. So we're always trying to test if, like, if this drug is going to be injected, that you don't get a, you know, a pinching nerve or like a pinching pain in your arm or wherever they're going to be injecting it. So I'm doing a little bit of that, and I'm also physically purifying drug substance as well. So I'm doing a little bit more of like, kind of staring at a screen, kind of, but like, you know, checking that certain you know attributes are correct or certain parameters are correct and then i'm also looking into process development which is like refining the process of synthesizing or purifying drugs for a myriad of like ailments and you know other things it's very amgen deals with a lot of i guess diseases and we try to specialize or try to be broad and depending on the uh i guess the path that they're trying to go for so yeah, I'm I'm fascinated because people specialize, right, in their lanes. And I'm always fascinated when these ramifications of people's specialization interacts with the popular person. And especially when you talk about the pH levels and injections, I, I really see this coming up in popular culture. I wonder if, if you have as well. In terms of injections... I think one of the things, sometimes it's controversial, sometimes it's you know something that just needs to be more understood, but it's understood by fewer people and the masses need to understand better. I imagine no injection is going to have like 0% harm to people. W- what are the thresholds and how do people determine like the threshold? Like, uh, you know, one out of 10 is so- probably really bad, you know, but... Uh, one out of a hundred, a little less bad. One out of a million, really less bad. Uh, you know, seven out of a billion, uh, that's probably like some of the best <laughs> ever. Well, I, I don't know though. I'm, I'm spitballing. Is there 
like how do people project what is an acceptable threshold? Is it based off of the company's own decision? Is it in conversation with the regulatory agencies like the FDA? Funny enough, um, I'm a little stressing because next week uh, the FDA will be auditing Amgen and its labs with you know regulatory, you know. So the audit, it's like it's just checking if we are up to regulatory standards via its own internal standards and the FDAs. So I'll be representing Amgen within the lab, talking to government officials about what we're doing and things like that. From you know different how we're testing different assays on different parameters, whether or not they meet the U.S. pharmacopoeia, the Japanese pharmacopoeia, the European pharmacopoeia. There's just, just a ton of other things, but um. To go back to in terms of injections, um, yeah, that's really for the Food and Drug Administration to determine, but it's also for um, kind of our own internal labs to determine the mode of dosage or the mode of how we dose the medication to people. Um, a lot of the times from what I know from talking with process development is um, usually it depends on the molecule that we're delivering to the patient um if it's a little bit more sensitive and it needs to be in a media-based uh form it's going to be injected but we usually try to do pills for any mm -hmm. way possible because we know for a fact that what i like about amgen it's not only takes pride in like you know the biosimilars and all the other drugs that we kind of produce it also really takes care of the patient and how we present the medication to them and how they admit how it's administered to so we try to do it in a pill form as much as we can or some kind of painless way that they can take it and we i like i learned this recently like um, a lot of the medication also comes with like a survey and like you know how how was this you know administered did you like this like would you prefer something else in the future so it's kind of interesting um but we try our best to avoid injection from what I can understand. Yeah, I'm I'm forgetting the the technical term of it now, and I'm I'm so embarrassed because I I knew it up until very recently. I remember I was editing a paper, and someone had confused this word with another word. But uh, you know, I've you're gonna have to help me out here it's when okay. the pill f it comes in pill form, but through the rear end as opposed through or. or Say it again. Is it rectal? Yeah, yeah, but there's another, there's another word for that uh, type of pill, uh, and I know, I know, like that's, uh, you know, it's not ideal, but sometimes there's there's something about how that works that I don't know. It's is it in acts quicker or something? Yeah. That... So, <laughs> so the rectum or your bowel <laughs> is uh it's the the skin. And the blood cells there, or the blood um, vessels there, are the line is long story short, it's a lot thinner, so it can take up a lot more of, let's say, like the pill that you're putting up there very quickly compared to orally, because um, it takes a lot longer for it to hit your blood system or your 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 blood system via you know orally taken versus rectally, um, because when you deliver it through there, it hits your bloodstream more directly. So there's a big difference. So if like you take it, you know, rectally, um, I'd say it's a lot faster. That's the big difference. It's just the rate at which we metabolize it. You're really hitting the bloodstream faster. Yeah. And so this is why my channel is called the philosophy of art and science is that with almost anything, especially medical issues, again, as I say, they're the specialists who are triaging or triaging the priority level of what could be harm and how to reduce harm, how you're deciding between injections and pills and then with even pills between rectal and oral. And then here, it's not just science, right? Because the purely functional person would come here and say, no, obviously you just do whatever is most effective. But obviously, you know, the reason you're chuckling and chortling is because no matter you know how mature we are and how disciplined we are in these matters, there's an aesthetic there which brings art into science. There's a form along with the function where some people will say, "Well, can I avoid that? Can I do this?" You know, there are trade-offs to every single medium that you select, and so it's interesting hearing about it from 
the perspective of the producer, the perspective of the regulatory agency, this perspective of the consumer, and and how all of those are interacting. The the other thing you said about pH stuck out to me. I don't know if you've you've come across this, but especially in the past, I'd say two to three years, through my wife and through our beloved Abba Thomas. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I used to just not care whatever water I drank. You know, I survived water in Ethiopia. Not that I was born there, but when I had it and I got sick, but I survived. So I figured, you know, wherever I am in South Central LA or wherever, I'll drink the water. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes it's a little yellow. It's got other stuff. But I, through my wife and through Abba Thomas, got more into this, the filtration systems. And then through studying the life of, of Nipsey Hussle, who passed a few years ago, he shed a lot of light on this Dr. Sebi, and people could think all sorts of things about him, but he's That's kind true. of a, into alternative medicine. And he, one of the things he focused on the most, though, was on alkaline water. And I think he really popularized that language, particularly in anti-institutional black uh, culture. He really has popularized the alkaline water, but all over South LA and Hispanic uh, kind of like laundromats and uh, even the chain grocery stores, you see these uh, these alkaline stores, these water stores, and they typically have the pH scale between 1 and 14. They show the kind of regular acidity of, of water as you find it in different areas for tap. Then they have something they call a premium water, which is around, I think, pH 7. And then the alkaline is typically somewhere between like 8 to 10 and right around 9. And it always makes me wonder, though, is it, you know, it's not an all positive scale. Like, what if it was like if it's pH 14 or 15, like, is it too healthy or, you know, what is the range that's drinkable? So I don't know if what you do is related to drinking water, but this is where I see some of what you're talking about in relation to what the everyday person is is doing all around them to try to live a healthier life. Uh, in terms of what we do to find pH, it's just kind of like making sure that there aren't like residual buffers that because throughout the process, we're always suspending our protein within a buffer. And depending on the buffer, it might have a pH that might be adversely effective to like immunocompromised patients that have a myriad of conditions that I don't even know what they would have. Um, it's very much just kind of checking whether or not our purification process is, is successful, that we were able to ultra filtration or diafil or some other like process that would eliminate that and then filter in a different buffer. But in terms of like what you were saying with water, um, we, in the lab, we have, we use different types of water. I mean, there's like the tap water and then there's like milliQ water, which is like reverse osmosis. And then there's DI water mm -hmm. where it has eliminated almost every single mineral. It's just water, like pure water. Um, uh, but Thomas does the reverse osmosis. Reverse osmosis is good. It's very good for you. It eliminates a lot of the, um, any sort of biological remnants of it left um, in the sense that we're using a kind of a membrane to filter it out. Water is a very small molecule and any other larger molecules or ions are much bigger. So you'll ca capture it within that membrane. Um, in terms of the types of water, I mean, I, I'm, I'm kind of still like you pre your wife and Thomas, I, I, I would just, I'll drink water. Um, I know that it's probably true that there is a optimal pH, but that's what I was asking. Because yeah. you work on you work on this stuff. You have the foreknowledge, but does it does it change the way you interact with water? Or is it is it like a negligible health difference and that's why? Or you just feel like you're young and invincible? Like what is it? <laughs> um I, I've never thought about that. I think it's uh I know that there is an optimal scale, but I don't think I'm gonna go out of my way and look for it. I mean if I mm -hmm. see it Alkaline water is going to be a little bit better for you because if you drink something that's more acidic or anything more neutral, you want to keep the minerals in your body. Um, through osmosis, you might suck up any of the minerals from your, from your blood and you might be missing some key minerals like potassium and sodium and calcium. So there's one way to look at it, but at the same time, it's like, I'm not going to go hunting for it. I'm, if, if I see a bottle of water, I'm going to finish it within seconds. Yeah. So I have some like raw friends who are kind of funny. And, and sometimes I have a little bit of this attitude myself. Is there such thing as too healthy? Like is having alkaline water all the time, not exposing you to some, I don't know, necessary evils or necessary poisons that are in the acidic water? Like is, I don't know, do you have like in your exposing yourself to whatever water, is that like your subconscious actually saying, oh, I need some of this bad stuff in me? 
not at all it's like purely just like i don't even put that much thought into it actually as much as i'm thinking all the time and in my head i don't even put that much into just water i don't know i'll just drink water um in terms of like the necessary evils i feel like the last time i heard about that it's like um i think it's like being like let's say like a couple like this is gonna sound completely random but uh let's say like you know when a couple has like a child like a baby um not being too sterile with the baby you would want the yes. baby to to build natural immunity so like i think that's not random same idea yeah, yeah, same yeah. idea it's the same, you're, you're exposing the baby to a necessary evil like i think my i remember my mom taking care of like i think like one of my aunt's babies and the baby spat out the pacifier onto the floor so i go to grab it to wash it and she's like no 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 and she takes it from me and like sticks it back into the baby and i was like what <laughs> like you don't want to clean that she's like no she'll yeah. be fine and i'm like okay she'll be fine and at the time i was like that's weird and then i kind of read about it in the sense of like the baby has natural immunity obviously with breast milk and like the immunity that the mother has passed on to her child but it also needs to build that environmental immunity so um but i mean for me um i'm not really thinking about the quality of my water um if i'm thirsty i'm gonna find the closest source to quench my thirst if anything yeah that's funny yeah that's exactly right and i've um in in some ways i was sheltered that way but not as much as i've seen other people be sheltered and mm -hmm. um you know I, i'm no asthma specialist or anything like that but i think things like asthma the environment that you put them in i i've seen that have an impact i've i've heard uh, a biologist and uh, a dentist talking about the way in which and it's crazy because they never met me and they don't know really Ethiopian food, but I had this interaction with Ethiopian food that it didn't make sense to me until I heard them speak. It's like some people, when they're very young, are exposed to very hard food, whereas others, like, they're like, oh, it's a baby, don't give it hard food. But what happens is it has an impact on how your teeth grow and your ability to chew. So I think that I was given probably too soft food as a child. And it made me unable to eat kurt and gurat gurat. Like I can't swallow it. This just sounds weird. Like when I chew it, it just chews and it just stays there forever like gum. And it's weird because I see my other friends just able to swallow it different. And then you ask them, like my friends from Ethiopia, when did they start eating this food? And some of them, it's very young, like seven or, or five or three even. And I didn't eat that food till I was in my 20s, maybe 21 or 22. And so my, I didn't develop that. And so I had, I heard one Ethiopian chef tell me that. And then I heard a bio, an evolutionary biologist at a dentist is having a conversation and they said the same thing. And when a chef, an evolutionary biologist and a dentist are on the same page, you're like, okay, maybe, maybe that's it. That's so I, yeah. <laughs> I, I think there's something there. Um, I don't know if you've ever had kurt or, or gored gored. Are you able to chew those? You know what it is though? The, the red raw meat. Yeah, I not know about that. Full. Not, not good full. No, you yeah. know, I I definitely struggle. Um, I think I was probably the same way. Um, I think it's I, uh, with meat in particular, if it's not if it if it's past medium rare, I I it takes me a while. It's like it's like gum. I'll just be sitting here and just smacking it, smacking it. Yeah. And like I would have to take it out, rip it, and then eat it, which is I mean maybe TMI, but anyways. Um, yeah. yeah, my teeth aren't sharp enough. Um, I think I was also pretty sheltered. Um, but and it's like, not any disgust. You don't have any disgust over it because some people just have like this, you know, this nausea or something as a reaction. You're like trying to eat it. I am trying my best to eat it. And what's funny is I was like going to mention about the intersectionality of like different, I guess, viewpoints and how to see problems and solutions. I've always kind of liked that. Um, I mean, uh, like, especially with like the chef and like knowing that like exposing your child to like, uh, certain foods. I think it's also the same thing with how people develop allergies too. Um, if you were to like not have your child exposed to different foods, they'll develop allergies later. I think this is also the fact that like um, why some people are allergic to eggs or peanuts mm. it's also because they aren't exposed to that also. And the fact that like egg contains certain ingredients that are the same thing in vaccines. So people also get, you know, allergic reactions when they take vaccines because there are certain parts of the egg because the egg is an embryo, right? And so there are certain parts of that that is used within a vaccine 
in a myriad of ways. I know that's an older version of vaccines. So this this is like a 30 year old study that I was reading about where like people who are allergic to eggs are also getting reactions to vaccines. It's also because they weren't exposed to things like eggs as a child too. So you can be sheltering with your child, but not too much. So it's that fine balance of letting your child um, interact with the world and whatnot i suppose <laughs> yeah and that's what that's what i try to do is you know my personality type is to try to think deeply and critically about everything and i think that creates two types of people when they interact with me one group that loves me and one group that hates me because they don't want to critically think about everything so you know here we are talking about water and your work and so many things like you know what you eat but i, I think it benefits to to think and dwell on these things as opposed to just being like a a passive uh, recipient of, of all of this stuff. Um, w one of the things we touched on earlier to, to continue this thread on uh, reading before we hit the video games, the, um, I remember, like I told you, I had given you a couple religious texts and the, the church always has this, um, this thing in the diaspora where they feel like the, the captive audience of students that are brought by their parents is one thing, but once they enter uh, college, especially if they go out of city, out of state, and then, you know, they, they become to see, you know, they're not at their home parish. Maybe they go to another parish. Maybe they don't go to any parish or come for the holidays. And they begin to see, you know, if you miss a Sunday or two, the, the heavens don't immediately fall on your head. So, uh, you know, the, the kind of urgency that maybe the parents used to have is not there uh, so i wonder what what became of either scriptural reading or any you know anything faith-based or religious uh, for you in college and beyond because i know obviously you know you were gearing up if you if you didn't go to a different uh state you were gearing up to take over i know the one of the sunday classes for me and we, i remember you were stepping up in in those roles earlier on um, and I know you connected with some people of, of the faith, but I don't know the, the full extent of it. Did, did you have any time for reading on, on those subjects? I did. Um, I definitely used them as like a, almost like a strength, um, going to school in Michigan. I mean, yeah, I had like a scholarship and I was with like, you know, these people who were from LA, but they didn't have, I guess that, uh, unique, um, I would say perspective um i mean we have a strong community ethiopian community ethiopian orthodox community and i was still very close to my like you know my religion um so i definitely read in order to strengthen and also to like you know keep myself occupied and remember that i am ethiopian also um when you kind of it's interesting because it was a, such a transitional phase for me um also very abrupt at the same time uh, there was a lot of things going on that uh, I just didn't know how to, I guess, flow by myself. I think a lot of people like me or like, you know, who go off to college by themselves, it's like you want to preserve the core values of you, but also kind of be be like water in the sense mm -hmm. of like you want to be, you know, your, your identity to be fluid. So um, I read a little bit, but I think towards the end, I kind of dropped it in the sense of like I wanted to see what it was like in different, I don't know how to describe this. I think it's more of like, I just wanted to see for myself what was out there, I think. And I think for a while I put it down just to see what other perspectives and what other almost religious texts text, uh, kind of talked about. Um, I took a class um, that studied like the Middle East and the Quran. And then I also studied a lot of things in like East Asia too. And what I found is like a lot of commonalities in like, you know, different ways of like preaching or teaching certain lessons that I found similar to like the Bible and the similar to like what we find in like uh, the Orthodox church. So it was just kind of, I think I kind of did like this full circle around the world and kind of came back to the same conclusions. I just wanted to see most of the world, I think, and kind of be more worldly or at least more in tune of like what the knowledge is out there, if that makes sense. So. It does. It does. I've had similar pendulum swings in my life. That's how I, I view it. You know, it goes back and forth because the person who, let's say, has only been exposed to 
the ideas of the religion they were raised into is not going to understand it in the way in which a person who's exposed to those ideas then is exposed to other ideas in a sort of exploratory phase and then comes back having you know in mature adulthood chosen it for themselves as opposed to having it just thrusts upon them That's exactly which what I was thinking, uh, you yeah. know we're not protestants we don't um we don't decry parents for their imposition is thrusting whatever you do you're thrusting some yeah. worldview or ideology yeah. upon your kids it's it's unavoidable whatever you know you're expressing whatever you're doing they're gonna eat it up and it's gonna be identifiable even if you can't express it it's gonna be identifiable as as some worldview i love the word abrupt you're saying so let's do a, an abrupt uh, transition unless you have any final thoughts there uh I had seen, and I was posting, I don't even remember what the video game was, but I saw this, uh, uh, I believe he's a Yemeni guy who was posting about Yemen and Ethiopia in a video game that he was playing, and I loved the map he was posting. R more recently, I had seen a lot of photos and even video game footage from Civilization VI with Emperor Mindelik and Civilization V with uh, Emperor Haile Selassie, but you and another friend of mine from high school are two people who uh, have suggested to me EU4, which is Europa Universalis 4. Mm -hmm. And that's actually on the Steam network, which I grew up playing Counter-Strike on. And then a lot of my oh. Sunday school students now, both at, at, um, connected to a church in DC in addition to LA, they're obsessed with Minecraft. I, I hear Minecraft everywhere, and that's all out of Steam as well. So I'm familiar with like the environment in which that one came up and I'm always interested like when people go to EA Sports I'm the 2K guy when people are on FIFA I'm the guy who's like what about Pro Evolution Soccer or Pez so mm -hmm. you and this other guy talking about EU4 when everyone else is talking about civilization that is interesting to me and I don't know if you know there's a guy uh, Hassan Piker he's a very famous now Turkish left -wing, Yeah the Turkish uh, guy. The young Turks Yeah 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 yeah, yeah no okay. I, I, yeah 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 okay you know him so he, if you know, like he's amassed a lot of wealth and some people from the left wing perspective have critiqued him on that, you know, can you have the quote unquote praxis of uh, like a capitalist while having the <laughs> alleged ideology of a left wing? Anyway, that's yeah. a funny question in its own, but he's gotten a lot of this wealth from Twitch streaming. And so I have this idea of myself and gathering others. I haven't set up the equipment enough, but I want to get into like talking politics and and talking Ethiopia while playing, be it Europa Universalis or Civilization, like playing these these real-time strategy games where you um, you are Ethiopia or Aksum or whatever the name, Abyssinia, whatever the name is in the game. Mm -hmm. And I know you don't, you don't position yourself as an expert, but any experience you have is going to be more than me on this because I've just heard people talking about it and I'm the ideas guy. So tell me about any of your experience in this stuff and uh, who knows? Maybe we'll be Twitch streaming millionaires one day together, and then okay. you could do your, uh, you could use it to fund your crazy science ideas. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because um, I have actually have friends who, you know, they started Twitch uh, and you know they're streaming, and they talk about a lot of things. Sometimes, you know, very shallow or stupid ideas or stupid subjects to like, you know, kind of deep things. Um, I suggested to them they should that they should talk about, you know, a lot more social justice things because they are black creators too. At the same time, I think I'll. Twitch is very seen as a very white platform or just a very stereotypical platform that, you know, a certain type of people will use. And I've always kind of just pushed for them to talk about their experiences and things like that. Um, but in terms of like EU4, um, it's funny because I saw it, I saw a friend in college. He was a history major and he played all these different types of war games, all these different types of like geopolitical war games and things like that. And I remember seeing like I was captivated on how beautiful the maps were made. And like how you can see things from like, you know, a bird's eye view, you can see the politics and like, you're literally running a country like you, you send, you know, um, diplomats to different countries to, you know, up the, uh, the friendliness of the, uh, of a country or, you know, you're sending merchants to different nodes and like, you, let's say, I play like Ethiopia a lot. I'm biased. Like I'm going to play Ethiopia. I'm going to. You better. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and it's funny because it's like, I'm, I'm very much of a conquerist when I'm in Ethiopia, like playing as Ethiopia, I'm going to take the whole horn of Africa and every, like, I'm like taking everything. You mean greater Ethiopia? Literally greater <laughs> Ethiopia, pretty much. I'm taking everything. Um, 
And like, do you cross like, the Red Sea and take back our old Yemen? I, I, I do actually. I um, it starts off in like I think like the eleventh or tenth century. I think that that's as far as it goes. And I'll go all the way up the Nile. I will take all of Egypt and everything. Ace. Like the and <laughs> yeah, I'll take I'll take the entire Nile because there's a node on the Nile that is probably like the richest in terms of like mercantile power. So if you have the money, I'm gonna fund use that money to fund the wars down south and taking everything. So let's zoom out a little and tell us about the game. Is it you playing on your own, like you versus a computer, or is it PvP? Are you playing against other players online or on a local network? So you can do it on a local network and a I believe like PvP type. I haven't gone to that part because the computer will still kick my ass no like any day. Like I will go a couple centuries, maybe like maybe to like the 16th century and then be out mm -hmm. of money. And then wait, wait, starting from when you go to the 16th century, but beginning when I think 11th or 10th, but there's also DLCs that let you go back to like very ancient times too. And you mm -hmm. can go all the way to like, maybe like the is 18th it, century. just for the audience. DLC is what downloadable content. What is yeah, that? Downloadable content. So that's like behind a paywall and like that just adds more features to the game. Um, and like our, let's say it's very wide. How many uh, DLCs they have. These DLCs will include like, you know, different phases of like you know africa like um or like different part like different time zones or uh there's one that um i think kind of covers the renaissance more in like europe or like you know uh co focuses more on china and like uh the different various kingdoms that they had it's very like per continent or probably even per country too it's very specific mm -hmm. like kind of adds more of the experience and the richness of you're really playing through history but like if it was on your terms, if that makes sense. And then there's other, yeah. it's just, so it's, so it's kind of a crazy. historical fiction. So it makes me wonder, um, there's this debate in, in history and in journalism about objectivity. And one of my favorite writers is this guy, Jeff Riggenbach, who's written a great book on American history. And like, I think something like what they say about American history is wrong. And in there, he talks about, you know, what really is the difference between history and historical fiction? And and he pretty much says the line is much blurrier than a lot of people would like. So I wonder, do you find yourself just getting, I don't know, catharsis after work or during weekends when you play EU4? Or is there any learning that you've done, like in looking at the beauty of the architecture, the maps, the names of the places, going through these these time periods? Is there anything like real and tangible you've learned, or is it all fiction? You know, which goes back to the criticism of your parents about you reading fantasy. Which, by the way, I got the same criticism. <laughs> Why don't you go read? He said, my dad said, if if you spent half the time you spent on fiction on nonfiction, you'd have been like ten times smarter. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and I always counter with my dad now. It's like, well, look where I am now. Um, I feel like <laughs> <laughs> I always bring that back to him. But um, catharsis in terms of like when I play EU4, um, yeah, I do. Sometimes it's like, let's say I'm starting a new save and I'm beefing with someone from like the Middle East or like a different neighboring country. I'm I'm going to go to war. I'm going <laughs> to like, it'll be like the slightest thing. I'm like, let's say like, you know, they took like a, uh, a trading post or a trading note that I really wanted. It's like, all right, you know, that's cost for word. Like, let's go. Like, <laughs> I'm gonna raise up everybody in the army. I'm gonna raise up this like the infantry, the cavalry, everything, and it just kind of go go crazy. Um, yeah, I think EU four is very much historical fiction. It's just real, and I would say in the realest sense, historical fiction. Like, I can't just go crazy. Like, I'm gonna go out. Of, I'm gonna go broke. You know, it's like. Or let's so have say, you, have you learned from like has have you learned anything in playing the game that you wouldn't have had you not played? Oh the yeah, game? yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's different times in Ethiopia that I didn't know like happened. Um, uh, I think there's one part where, you know, you really have like a religious like unity with Ethiopia. I think that's what I like the most. It's like you can get behind certain things. Um, the church has huge power in Ethiopia. Like very huge like a lot of power like there are certain things or certain decrees and like you know edicts that i want to pass but i need to be okay with the church before i do so and then there's a point in time where islam is introduced to ethiopia and so i will have a split in my population so most of my population would say would be outraged or enraged let's say if i go to war with an islamic country so I can't, you know, bring soldiers from there or I would have to like quell the rebellion that's there or whatnot. So it's very, it's almost, it's pretty accurate in that sense. 
Um, and then there's ob obviously different kings that you get to play as. Like you can go through, you know, Menelik, Tedros, and all these other ki kings that you know, you know, ruled Ethiopia. Do you have a favorite? Do I have a favorite? I feel like if I said my favorite, I wouldn't know enough to say because okay, no worries. Uh, of the, um, I would say the, I wouldn't want to say the climate, but the histories that exist of different historical figures within Ethiopia. But yeah. you, you do play through these different periods all the way almost to the point of like, you know, Italio Ethiopian War Two, where it's like, yeah, you have different, you know, invasions and things like that. But um, you learn it's a lot. Interesting. Do do they make the Ethiopian troops like one homogenous Ethiopian tribe or do they represent within Ethiopia like the various tribes as different factions? You mentioned religion. Um, the government of the past 28 years or so emphasized this huge tribal difference. I thought too much, but there is also a way in which you can de-emphasize the tribal difference as if there are no different tribes. Does the, does the game either homogenize them or or represent the differences like i don't know do you have like a cavalry unit from one tribe and then an infantry unit from another tribe and a seafaring unit or something like that like the naval forces i will have to say whoever developed this game knew what they were talking about because they very much labeled the regions correctly of ethiopia like shawa hawasa aksum like these different places rc um how to uh there's these and they had they even go down to like the ethnic regions of like where these people would be living at the time. So it's just really interesting to see how thought out and how realistic and almost like the detail is what I think will probably blow you away if you play this game because it's very detailed and it's very, there's so much depth to it too. So, I mean, the cavalry you'll get is from Shawa um, and then you'll get like more infantry based from like Harad or like Northern Ethiopia too. So it's just really interesting on like what, um, you know, where you would grow your forces and then a lot of like fortresses and like defensiveness would be kind of clustered within the Ethiopian highlands and not so much on the outside too. So it's just really interesting on how there's so much depth and you see the cultural impacts, let's say like, um, I think there's one event for Ethiopia where it goes through uh, King Lalibela and he talks about building, you know, the rock hewn churches in Lalibela, like establishing like a center, like a new Jerusalem almost. So it kind of like Ethiopia goes through this like huge religious explosion of like art and culture. And so the population is happier and it's like all these other things. So it's very detailed. And I think you would, that, that's why I suggested it to you is just the sense of like how much goes on when you play this game. There's so many things you can continue to read and so many scenarios that you can play differently. So I definitely suggest it to you. I am blown away. I've been dwelling on like the way that I act is so interesting. Like I need to hear the same thing from different people. Like oh, earlier, you know, I told you it was the, the chef and the dentist and the evolutionary biologist. Now it's a random friend on, on Facebook from high school who I hadn't seen since high school, you know, slid in my DMS to tell me about EU four. And then, you too now same thing like and you two are totally different people uh, from different parts of my life that don't know each other and both of you have independently given rave reviews of that and both of you are uh, two people whose opinions i would respect too you know it's not everyone's opinion is not weighed the same and so i'm definitely convinced and i'm it's just a matter of time now before i figure out exactly how to do the twitch setup and you know, I might have to figure out housing things first because I want to make sure if I do it, I, I do it and I do it on point and I do it consistently. Even people on my YouTube stream have been like, oh, dude, you do lives, but you don't tell us when. Like, when are you going to do it? Oh, I don't have a consistent enough life to, to do it yet, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I need to, to think about that um, as, as like a plan because I, I really do think, as you mentioned, there is a space. By the way, this is my view on every medium. I think every medium is functional. People forget that whether we're talking about scripture, you know, I, I teach that the lion is used uh, for the devil. It says that he is a lion roaming around and ready to consume anyone, but it's also used of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. the, uh, the lion of Judah that has conquered. The snake is, everyone thinks of the snake in the Garden of Eden as the devil, and yet the snake on a stick in numbers and later quoted in the gospel of john is jesus and they they get snakes that give them 
uh, destruction and poison, but they also have a snake on a stick that that saves them and heals them. Yeah, I, I say that to say that Twitch, TikTok, YouTube, these things for me is why I didn't buy the whatever social media documentary on Netflix that everyone was buzzing about. Mm -hmm. All of these things are functional. It's how the user uses them. Now, if the user is weak, then yes, they will delve into using it for all the wrong means, like the internet itself. But if the user is strong and focused and intentional, I believe that any medium, any tool can be used to glorify God or uh, you know, to have fun in, in pursuing justice or in talking about politics or really anything. Like you can do things intelligent, like it doesn't have to be dumb. So I'm certainly convinced and maybe you and me and a bunch of other people will, will be uh, Twitch streamer, Twitch streaming millionaires that represent Ethiopia to the fullest uh, and greater Ethiopia, uh, the Horn of Africa and in, uh, 100%. <laughs> in the Arab Peninsula and the Red I'm, Sea. I'm already everywhere. sold. I'm already sold. <laughs> I'm already sold. You'll see me. Yeah. I'll just go off. I'll just go crazy with it. Like <laughs> I can't wait. So do, do you have any uh, parting thoughts, any straight thoughts on uh, whether it be video games, faith, science? Um, E.O. Wilson is a scientist who passed away recently, a naturalist um, who is a prolific writer. And um, he wrote, I think, letters to a young scientist, something to that effect. So he, he had some prolific writings I've, I've been reading his his texts in biology recently in a way of uh keeping his memory alive but do you have any letters words for scientists be they young or old you know they could be out of school and maybe getting back into science like uh, this old man or they could be young and get into the field or or, or anything to do with faith or or video games anything that we've discussed um i think anything we left out I think uh, for those emerging or planning on going into the STEM field or even any field, um, as much as we separate subjects, I think they have an inter interconnectedness that they have. Um, I suggest you explore that because it can only make you better. Um, I've learned that for a fact. I actually, quick story, um, as I was, you know, major day was coming up, I couldn't choose between biology and chemistry. I had a kind of a chemistry affinity, but I loved biology at the same time. I found biochem and I didn't even know biochem existed. So I suggest you find those spaces that you can kind of combine certain passions together and then you can kind of follow that and things kind of fall into place afterwards. So I suggest to those younger than me, older than me that, are, you know, want to get back into STEM, it's not so scary as you think, as long as you kind of have a different lens that will make it easy for you to understand and Anyone can do science. Thank you so much, no. Thank you so I'm much. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>